Hi, just a few days ago, I was at one of our supporting churches, Holmes Avenue, with Pastor Brian Ayer, and I was given the privilege of bringing the message that morning. And that's what this is, uh, this video, and I'd like to share it with you. And I hope that it's a blessing to you. I hope that it encourages you. First, hear from Brian, and then the message. Father, as we are gathered here today, we remember also, Lord, our partner in ministry, Christ-Centered Solutions. Lord, I'm so grateful for Dr. West and his loving pastoral heart and care. Lord, I thank you so much, Lord, that you have called him to this ministry. I thank you, Lord, that, that you allow us to participate in some way, shape, or form by being a ministry partner. Lord, not only financially, but even with a, an office for him to be able to meet with clients here in Charleston. Lord, thank you for what you're doing in this ministry. I pray, Lord, as they continue forward this year in 2022, Lord, that you would use this ministry in a powerful way, not only here in Charleston, but in Wilmington and the other areas. Lord, to impact lives with the hope of the gospel through biblical counseling, through premarital counseling, and the other areas of pastoral care that he provides. Thank you for him, Lord. Thank you for this ministry. And I pray, God, that you would bless it mightily. Here's our title for today. Lord, I know I need to change. I, I know I've said it many times in my life, and I bet many of you have also. At some point in your life, you said, Lord, I know I need to change. And that phrase is normally almost always followed by this word. You ready? But. Lord, I know I need to change, but... But it's hard, Lord. But it's not my fault. But I, I don't know how to change. Or maybe it's, but I'm a good person, Lord, aren't I? Why, why, why is this happening? Why, why do I need to change? I'm a good person. We can take care of that right now. Jesus said there is none good, no, not one. Listen, when we come to the place that we know we need to change, it's normally because of the convicting power of the Holy Spirit that brings us to this conclusion. As believers, the, the Holy Spirit has sealed you. God, the Holy Spirit, has sealed you and ministers to you, and, and He convicts us when something's not right. And so with that thought, it, here comes another question. And the question is this. Once we're aware that God is calling us to change, to change something in our lives, what are we then willing to do? What, what are we willing? What are we willing to do in order to make that change? Do we do something or do nothing? Do we make an excuse or take an action. In our text today, Isaiah has reached that point in his life where he knows, he has become aware that he needs to change. But the, the people I see on a regular basis and the couples that I see, the vast majority of them come through the doors here and in Wilmington and Hampstead, North Carolina and in Wendell, North Carolina, because they know something's not right. And they need to change. I don't like something. I don't like the way I feel. I don't like the way I see certain things. I don't like this perspective. I don't like my life the way it is right now. Lord, I know I need to change. So what do you do? For Isaiah, it was... Am I going to be inactive and ignore the truth and do nothing? And that's, that was simply an op, not an option for Isaiah. It shouldn't be an option for us. Isaiah had reached a state of brokenness in which there was a point of no return. He was driven to his knees, so to speak, and probably literally as well. 
Several years ago, I was dealing with a young man who stated to another pastor and myself that he knew that the place where he was in life was not pleasing to God. See, he said he was a believer. Matter of fact, he stated that he was far from God's will. And, and as we talked with him, we could tell that he was just eaten up with guilt and shame and this, just this overwhelming burden on his life. Yet he was seemingly unable to move beyond his circumstances. He stated that he couldn't help the way that he felt. And you know what? I, I believe him. I, I believe these were his feelings. Our feelings are our feelings. They, they don't belong to anybody else. Feelings happen. But, but I want to clarify something here, and that is feelings and thoughts are two different things. But yet we often use them interchangeably. I, I can't help the way I feel, but I can do something about the way I think. And when you read the letters of Paul, when, when you listen to some of the things and read what Jesus said, what you come to is this conclusion that when he's talking about the heart, he's talking about the way you think. Christianity is very much, and you may have heard me say this before, Christianity is very much a thinking religion. Yet we try to make it a feeling one. He calls us to think. This young man went on to say that day that he couldn't help or stop the sinful things that he was doing even though he knew his actions and behaviors were wrong. At that moment, I knew that it wasn't that he couldn't change, but that he believed in one part that he was powerless to change. But it's more than that. It was more than just him thinking that he was powerless. It was also that he didn't want to change. It's easier to wallow in our Self-pity. It's easier to wallow in the muck and the mire. Change is difficult. If you're sitting here today or you're watching online and you claim to be a believer of Jesus Christ, a follower of Christ, He did not call you to a life of ease on this earth. For all those who preach a prosperity gospel saying that um, God wants you to be rich and healthy and all these other things. My question is then why did Jesus have to die the type of death that he did? Why did the apostles suffer as they did? Why were Christians throughout history and still today, why are they martyred for their faith? Is it because they have sinned and they're not listening to God? Or is it because the world hates them? Being a follower of Christ is difficult. Not every day, but a lot of days. Again, if we're honest with ourselves, isn't that the way most of us think when failures in life begin to mount? Like that young man, oh, I don't know what to do. I, I don't feel like I can do anything. I feel like that people are just oppressing me or things are oppressing me and I can't do anything about it. I feel powerless. That brings another question to my mind. If you or I know that we need to make some changes in our life, especially when it comes or concerns our walk with Christ, then what's our real motive for doing so? What's our real motive for change? Is it just to get the pain to stop even temporarily? Is it, okay, Lord, I'll do this, I'll do this, and things get a little better, and you go, and you kind of slide back into that old way? 
Or is it because you're truly broken spiritually? And you recognize, I recognize, we recognize that we need a Savior who can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. For the Christian, let me ask you this. Today, after maybe for some of you many years of being a follower of Christ, what value do you place on your relationship with Him? How important is your Christian walk to you? And so as we begin, and we're going to look at the passage here in just a moment, I want to share just a couple of things about the book of Isaiah in order to put some things into context for the passage that we'll be looking at. I want you to think about this. This book, 66 chapters, written 700, maybe a little more, years before Christ has some of the greatest chapters of prophecy in it concerning Christ, Isaiah 53 coming to mind. Down to the very point where he'll be buried. The book is overwhelming. It's a book that addresses the coming kingdom promises to Israel, to Judah, and Isaiah does this more than any other prophet. He speaks in depth about Israel's sin and God's glory. The division of the book is in two parts. Chapters 1 through 39 deal with God's judgment. Chapters 40 through 66 deal with Israel's deliverance, their salvation. And so judgment, what we see in this is that judgment comes before blessings. And this is in order to remind Israel of her covenant with God. Now, get this. There are two kingdoms at this time. There's the northern kingdom of Israel. There's the southern kingdom of Judah. Isaiah is primarily a prophet to Judah. But Judah is seeing what is happening to the tribes in the northern kingdom, the ten tribes there. Assyria is going to sweep in around 723, 721 B.C. And they're going to swallow Israel because of their sin, their religious syncretism, blending the truth of God's Word with all these other false idols and things. Assyria is going to come in and it's just going to swallow them up and take them into captivity. It's going to leave the land barren. Judah, on the other hand, they're a little more than a hundred years behind Israel. Isaiah is preaching his heart out. He's sharing with the people, judgment is coming, judgment is coming, judgment is coming. You need to change. I need to change. Look what's happened to our brothers and sisters in Israel. Now it's going to come to us. We must change. But in 605 B.C., King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon comes in and wipes them out. Or so we think. But over the next 15 years, he goes back two more times. And basically all he leaves are the handicapped people and, and, and those that can't take their care of themselves. Everything is destroyed. This leads us to the principles we're going to look at today and the steps that we need to take. Here's number one. It should be on the screen for you. If you, if I want to experience real change in your life, in my life, then we need a personal encounter with God. Real change always begins with an awareness that a change needs to take place. It begins with self-awareness. I ain't right. Something's wrong with me. It's where we stop blaming others. It's your fault, your fault, your fault. It's me. I can't change you. The only person I can work on is myself. 
Genuine change starts at the throne of God. Re remember Newton's first law? A body at rest will remain at rest unless an action takes place. Unless it is forced and uh, an act takes place upon it. And a body in motion at a constant velocity or speed will continue or remain in motion unless it is acted upon by another force. You know, you see that you, sometimes there are little desk things and they've got those silver balls and you hit one, right? You're the force. And it will continue. That energy is transferring until you stop it. Listen to this. Here, here's the spiritual part of it, and it's not on the screen. But you can go ahead and put the, next, the passage up if you'd like. But this comes from John chapter 1 and chapter 6. Jesus says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God acted. When God acted in your life, if you're a believer here today, you didn't come to him just because you wanted to come to him. Listen to this. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last days. That's Jesus speaking. Unless God acts, nothing changes. But when you become self-aware, I need something. God is ministering to you. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. In a sense, He's moving upon you. You need to change. It becomes like a megaphone. That's what C.S. Lewis said. Pain is the megaphone that gets our attention. God is the activating force for change in a person's life. Look at this, what Isaiah says in 6, 1-4. through in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And, and I just want a side note here. The difference bet between cherubs and seraphim, and the cherubs aren't these cute little babies with wings they're warriors the seraphim these are the attendants in the throne room of God and notice what they're doing and one called out to another and said holy 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 is the Lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory and that's true you know how I know that's true well one, I see it in the common graces that God has blessed us with. I'll give you a common grace. Fried chicken and greens, that's common grace. What's some other common grace? When you go out at night out of the city and you look up into the, the, the stars and it's a clear night and you see all these stars as you, in, the, in the skies. That's a common grace. That's, that's the... Uh, the natural revelation that there must be a God, there's something greater than ourselves. There's something else that we see in the glory, how the earth is full of His glory because He fills His people. The world should, should see God in you and through you and in me and through me. Notice what he says again in verse 4. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Again, notice his words, I saw the Lord. Isaiah is somehow transported or taken be it in a vision or, or some other way, he's taken into the, the heavenly tabernacle, the throne room of God, the actual tabernacle, the ones that were built in Israel and the one that is still to be built 
are just models of the real one. He goes into the throne room of God, and this is around 739 B.C. And, and in this chapter, he records God's call, and it emphasizes this extreme depravity on the nation of Israel in contrast to God's holiness. Let me tell you, when we come to the point that we know that we need to change, it's because we are standing in the presence of God and we recognize His holiness, His sovereignty, His greatness, His awesomeness, and how filthy we are. The people of Israel lacked this spiritual insight. And they wouldn't turn from their sinful condition. I actually think what Isaiah saw that day might have been the pre-incarnate Christ. Uzziah, the king, ruled for 52 years and, and it was a prosperous 52. But the people were far from God. Uzziah was disobedient. He, what happened to him was that he entered the temple. He was not unconscious, but just careless. And, and, and made God this small thing when he entered his temple. And he sinned. He was struck with leprosy and made ceremonially unclean. Isaiah, however, is now sensitive to this sin for himself and for his people. Now, there are three things that strike me about uh, this passage, Isaiah with God. He says he was sitting on, on the throne, or a throne, symbolizing his position of sovereignty, of a king. He was high and exalted. And it speaks of his long robe and, and the, this majesty about God. His royalty and the train of his robe filled the temple. It was, it was all encompassing. You couldn't escape it. And then you've got these angels, these seraphs, Proclaiming that God's glory fills the earth much more, much like His robe filled the temple. These angels were burning with passion for God, and, and that's what we should do. There's a praise of God in service, and this threefold repetition of the word holy is suggesting His, His supreme holiness. And by contrast, the people of Judah were unholy, like the people of Israel. Here's number two. If you want to experience real change, if I want to experience real change, then take a long look at yourself and reassess your life. Take an account. Look at where you are today. Look at your relationships, your relationship with your spouse, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your parents, with your church, with the Christian community, with the secular community. Listen, we all change. If you live long enough, you're going to change. I, I tell people when I look at myself and I go, ugh. I remind myself that there's an athlete in this body somewhere. I just haven't seen him for a while. Again, if we live long enough, we'll see all sorts of changes take place from a physical standpoint, but from a spiritual and emotional standpoints as well. We often change in how we see the world because of our experiences. When, when I was 20, 21, 22, Teresa and I hadn't been married long and, and, and I saw the world in a much different way. I remember when our 
oldest son was born and Teresa had to have a C-section and I'm rushing from, from my college class. I, I had a, a psych class and I'm rushing to the hospital and I get there and I'm all geared up and I'm watching my son come into the world. And so as they were taking care of him and they were taking care of Teresa, they told me to go change and where to meet her. And I went to this, it looked like a little locker room. It was this father's room. And as I began to take that gown off, I did. I dropped to my knees and I began to, to weep because of this son. Having children changes your view on the world. As you grow in your relationship with Christ, your views, your thinking should mature and you'll begin to see things differently. I've noticed that as I've gotten older, it, it's easier to put some things into the right priority than others. Some things just aren't as important anymore but genuine change takes place spiritually morally cognitively our thinking and it takes place as we live as followers of Christ and for that one person maybe here today or watching online that doesn't know Christ as Savior and Lord I pray change comes to you All of us at different times and seasons of life need to take a step back and take an accounting of our life. Where am I today in my walk with the Lord? Is there unconfessed sin in my life? Am I living in a state of denial? The Apostle Paul, you might remember, encouraged believers in Corinth to take a closer look at their lives and their church and to put things in the right order. Some of that you can read in 2 Corinthians 13, 1 through 5, where he talks about in verse 5, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Isaiah is doing the same thing 700 years before the arrival of Christ. Look at verse 5 on the screen. And I said, woe is me. Woe is is a type of judgment upon self. It's a mourning like someone has died. Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This vision of God's majesty, holiness, and glory made Isaiah realize, I'm a filthy sinner. I don't deserve His grace. And you realize what that grace is, right? It's not just an unmerited favor. It is God pouring out on you something that you don't deserve. His mercy is what He withholds from us that we do deserve. We deserve His wrath, yet He pours grace out and He withholds that wrath. So Isaiah here is pronouncing the woes, the threats of judgment. He's even saying, woe to me himself. He realized that he too was subject to judgment because he was unclean. He had sin in his life. And when we begin to see God in that way, it should stir us. We need to see ourselves in the light of his purity and his holiness. And when we do, the impurity of our sin is made all the more evident. Isaiah had unclean lips, which probably symbolized his attitudes and his actions as well as his words. And we need to realize that. 
Our words often reflect our thinking and our attitudes. And that's into, in relationship to our actions. Do, do people outside this body, do, do they know that you and I are believers based on the way we speak and the way we act? And I'll be the first to tell you, there's sometimes my actions and my words are not always Christ-like. I pray that the Holy Spirit convicts us when we, when we recognize that. Look at this, down. In Luke 5, 8. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Isaiah witnessed firsthand the majesty, the holiness of God, just like Peter did. Isaiah saw it in the throne room of God, and Peter saw it in the life of Christ. When we witness the power of God, it impacts us. It impacted Peter. And, and we too can see the majesty and the power of God every day in His Word and the beauty of His creation. But mostly, we should be able to see it in the salvation that He has imparted to us through His Son. Again, we need to daily take a reassessment, an accounting of our lives. Paul, I'm not going to read it to you, but in... Romans chapter 2, 1 through 8, Paul talks about the kindness of God and he says, don't you see, as God has poured out His kindness on you and you recognize His holiness, that it should reveal to you what you lack. He is holy and good and you are not. That is before Christ before you've trusted Him. God sees you today. If you're a child of God, it doesn't mean that you don't need to continue this change because that's, that's part of the doctrine of sanctification. You're continuously in a state of change, drawing near to Him. But when God the Father looks at us, I, I've said this thousands of times and it still blows me away. He looks at us through the prism of the blood of His Son and He doesn't see us as we were, but he sees us as we are and will be through Christ. God's love makes a difference. Here's number three, and I'm, I'm going to be quick, three and four, but number three, if you want to experience real change in your life, then clean up your act. It's, it's pretty simple. Clean up your act. I need to clean mine up sometimes. And when I talk about cleaning up the act, I'm not just suggesting that, I'm, well, I'm not suggesting at all that we have some active role in our salvation because we don't. But what I am saying that once we come to a saving knowledge of Christ and we step into His presence and He receives us and we bow before Him, once we're clean, we should see ourselves in a different light. And when we don't, oftentimes that's where doubt seeps in. Look at this passage, Isaiah 6, 6 and 7. It's on the screen. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hands a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. And your sin is atoned for. Your sin that word atone and atonement, it, it should blow us away. It means that we're covered. And what are you covered by? The blood of Jesus Christ. The only sacrifice that can, can do, again, for us what we can't do ourselves. We can't save ourselves, but He can. His sacrifice and resurrection. Again, Isaiah's Realizing his impurity 
and that he needs this cleansing. Here's the bottom line for Isaiah. He knew he needed to change. And as a side note, it it isn't easy for everyone to change. If you're this big, big, bad biker and you got, I love my mom on your arm and you ride a big hog and you've done all kinds of things and you come to Christ and, and you might change your clothes a little bit, you change your friends, you change your language, it's easy to see that change. For some people, it's not. Some people, like my wife, she's been in church since she, she was six weeks old. That might be some of you. By the way, do we have any big bad bikers in the church? Because I don't want to insult anyone. Change isn't or doesn't look the same for everyone. For some Christians, it takes more effort and more time. The struggles can and often do continue. The struggles, as the saying go, are real. So don't be led to, to the belief that every believer... Every believer's conversion looks like every other believer's. I've, just a side note, I've had Christians say, when I got saved, I put my cigarettes down and I never had a desire for them again. That's wonderful. But others struggle with that. And by the way, cigarettes don't send you to hell, okay? Okay. As that old saying goes, they don't send you there, they just make you smell like you've been there. Here's our last point. If you do experience real change, then your heart will say, send me. Send me, Lord. I'll go. Look at these verses. Isaiah 6, 8 and 9. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me, Lord. He said, Go and tell this people. Go. Let's just be real with one another. We're not all evangelists. We're not all preachers. We're not all Sunday school teachers. Some have the gift of of serving and and most of your work is done in the background but let me tell you we all have a responsibility to live out our Christian faith where others are drawn to it the the old story I, I like the story there was a preaching conference up in Chicago and D.L. Moody was uh, walking down the street with this young man who was at the conference, he was a young preacher, and they were talking about how the people of Chicago, there was a great lostness there. And the young man said to D.L. Moody, he said, "Uh, Preacher Moody, it's like leading a horse to water. You can lead them to water, but you can't make them drink. And D.L. Moody stopped and looked at him, and he said, Young man, it's not our duty. It's not our duty to lead them to the water, it's our duty to make them thirsty. The Word of God that's living richly in you and through you should create a thirst in others. I hope my life does that. The rest of chapter 6 deals with the message of Isaiah preaching to Judah and going to them. We too should go. Collecting shoes. Seems like a small thing, but it's one way to go. My, my ministry now and Teresa's is running this biblical counseling ministry for different churches and the church community, the Christian community. It's not for everyone, but we do have lost people come through sometimes. And some continue to come. And we pray. And we reveal the scriptures. And we we try to reveal God's will for them. Through his word. Let me tell you. 
God is calling us as individuals to change. If you're a follower of Christ, he's called you to change. And as the body of Christ at Holmes Avenue, you should come to the realization that you're in a state of constant change. The church today isn't the same as it was in 2019. And it wasn't the same in 2019 as it was in 1950. Change occurs. Continue to say, God, send me. I will go. So I leave you with this, and I'll call Brian up to close for us as he sees fit. My question is, do you need to change? Is there something in your life that you need to change? Do you know someone close to you that's trying to change? How can you help them? How will you respond, church, to those around us that are looking for change? Hey. Thanks for sticking around. If you've made it this far, can you give me just one more minute of your time? I realize change is difficult. Um, it seems like my entire life I've been going through a constant series of changes. And that's, that's probably true. We are as human beings. And some of it is caused by uh, the events in our life. Some of it is just that we're trying to mature. I uh, like myself. I'm, I'm constantly trying to become a better follower of Christ. And that doesn't mean I'm perfect. I'm far from it. Um, but it's a constant work. Listen, again, I realize change is difficult. And if there's some things in your life that are going on that you're struggling with and you need some help, Christ Center Solutions is here for you. I want to encourage you to visit our webpage, www.ChristCenterSolutions.org. And on that page, there are some resources you can read about us, uh, find out more about the ministry, but there's also a contact page. And I would encourage you to uh, click on that page and give us an email or uh, just give us a call at either the North Carolina or South Carolina number, and we're here for you. Um, I work with Pastor Dr. Don Cashwell. Uh, he's also out of North Carolina, but we meet people all the time online. And so we just want to encourage you, if you're struggling with change, contact us. We'll do our best to help you and walk with you. God bless.